I'm Ariel Lauren Wilson, Editor-in-Chief of Edible Manhattan and Edible Brooklyn. Um, I also organize the panel series for Food Loves Tech, and launching today, we have a podcast called In the Field, where if conversations like the one we're having here are of interest to you, go to the podcast. Urvashi just appeared on it yesterday. Her issue, um, her episode won't air for a couple months, but uh, yeah, we hope, you check, we hope you'll check it out. Um, but that said, I want to make use of our time, and I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves, starting with Jason. Hello. I'm Jason Grauer. I'm the crop production manager at Stone Barns. Uh, so that means that I am focused on all of the vegetable, flower, and herb production that we're doing, indoor and outdoor, and with a main focus on the distribution, where everything's going, and with that, what we're going to grow. So the seeds and breeds and all the relationships to the public and private seed relationships that are out there. Hi. Uh, Am I on? I think so. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Ravashi Rangan. Um, I'm an environmental health scientist, uh, toxicologist, and um, I am the chief science advisor with the Grace Communications Foundation. Um, we support a number of different um, sustainable food organizations, um, working for usually progressive reform in different places. And um, prior to that, I w ran the uh, food and uh, safety and sustainability group at Consumer Reports, testing lots of different foods um, and matching those with choices for consumers and better choices with regard to safety and sustainability. Also spent a lot of time rating labels, um, of which we currently on our site at foodprint.org uh, that we just launched last week, a little plug, and we have a booth across the street on the second floor, um, talk about the sort of holistic approach to the food system, looking at problems through a holistic lens and kind of a blueprint for solutions um, and choices people can make today so we can shift market demand tomorrow. Uh, hi, I'm Suzanne Cups. I'm the executive chef of Untitled Restaurant. Um, we are located in the Whitney Museum um, in the Meatpacking District and uh, part of the Union Square Hospitality Group, so Danny Meyer's, uh, Danny Meyer's group. Um, how's it going, everybody? You guys good? Good to be here again. Yeah, Sam is a repeat participant on this panel. On this very panel. So if you yeah. were here last year, I'm sorry, I'm going to say probably <laughs> pretty much the same thing. Uh, Sam Cass, um, I'm a partner at Acre, investing in the future of food around uh, human health and environmental health, uh, formerly uh, food policy the advisor White for House. Obama and their chef and the garden and all that good stuff. Nice. Um, so that we can just get started into this topic. Arvashi, um, if you could just give us, as a scientist, definitions of the three general types of breeding we're going to be talking about today in genetic engineering. If you could talk to us first about just traditional plant breeding, how it's been done um, for a very, very long time. Bring us into genetic modification, transgenics, and then CRISPR, uh, the new frontier. Sure. Uh, sorry, microphone. Yeah, sure. Um, so, and I, you know... You, the devil's in the details of all of this, but basically, you know, we can breed today in two um, categorically different ways, and one of them are through traditional breeding techniques where we're crossing plants usually of the same species with plants of the same species, and it's what would occur in nature that you can get pollen to do and seed crossing to do, and um, farmers have been breeding for lots of traits that way for thousands and thousands of years, and um, it requires seed propagation, being able to carry those through the generations. It's kind of a, you know, the sort of field biologists um, out there. That's what farmers have been for so long. And in studying crops and what you want, and I know you know so much more about this than I do, um, picking traits that you want for resilience isn't really about any one thing. So it's sort of um, picking for qualities in that plant at the end of a growing season and then propagating what you want to later on. And again, all of these things would generally occur in nature. <clears throat> the new breeding techniques that have been introduced in the last uh, you know, decade or two are really um, things that need to take place in a laboratory in order to happen. That doesn't make them inherently bad, it's just understanding that it's a very technological based thing, it requires 
um, DNA and PCR and lots of different biochemistry techniques in order to insert genes into another species' DNA. Initially, we were inserting things like a Brazil nut gene into a tomato um, or a one salmon gene or, a, or an eel into a salmon gene to turn on a growth hormone all the time. Um, and, uh, or or corn that produces its own pesticide, the BT pesticide, so we inserted that gene into the corn in order to do that. These are genetic manipulations that um, require, like I said, a lab, they are forced manipulations, um, and that's the other type of breeding that's occurring today. Um, as time has gone on in that field, there have been interesting modifications and specifications made. We can look more closely at certain genetic codes and cut those and modify certain genetic areas in other species. So things like the... Um, and that's CRISPR technology and that you're talking CRISPR. about. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Um, so the non-browning apple or the non-browning potato or the non-browning mushroom, these are things that are sort of these single traits that are thought to be able to be manipulated through these types of technological-based genetic manipulation. So that's the other class. Whether it's the broad GMO species, crossing species, or even within the technology and the force that you're putting onto that DNA to manipulate it is quite similar. The outcomes are quite similar. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, before, um, Sam has a lot to say. Um, but before Sam does, I do want, I think it's unusual to see a chef and a farmer on a panel talking about these technologies and together. But I do think it's important because, um, you know, they're the ones making the decisions too about what all of us eat. Um, and so that said, starting um, with Jason, could you tell us about, you know, how you make decisions about the types of things you grow? And then Suzanne, if you could continue that by talking about how you make decisions about the ingredients you're going to put on a plate. Yes, definitely. So, okay, one of, one of the most important things is like this, this always needs to happen. This, if you don't know, this isn't happening. This bringing together of the farmer, the chef, policymakers and entrepreneurs and scientists, like, that, like it's all got to come together to make that decision. So that's the responsibility of the farmer in a lot of ways. So the way I look at the farmer is that we're the intermediary for all of us between the ground and between our bodies. So there's a huge responsibility on the farmer to make the right choice. So how do you make that choice? Without going so deep so that we can all go into it, I mean, the baseline of all that we have to think about, a good farmer has to think about, is that the result, the product, is not the only part of our success. What's important is this entire ecosystem. That is the onus that falls on the farmer's shoulders. That is the thing that when we forget about the farmer and we don't look at the farmer, we don't make the farmer a part of the community, that's where that there's no one looking at it. You're not a part of it, so you can make a decision that doesn't think about the ecosystem. But the truth is that they, all the decisions we make affect that system. And seed, as well as how we manage the soil, is paramount to the health of that soil, the health of that system. So that's the... The choice is, is it good for the ecosystem that I am responsible for, that we're all responsible for? That's the generalized, simple version of how you make that decision. Yeah, and Suzanne, about, what about at Untitled at the Whitney? Yeah, so um, our restaurant, if you haven't been there, is based around the green market and the local farmers. Um, we're not vegetal, vegetarian, but we're vegetable forward. Um, we care about where each of our ingredients come from. Um, sourcing is, is a huge part of our business. And I think it's important to remember as a chef, um, you're serving the folks that come to your restaurant. So they're, they're your guests, they're the people that have to respond to what you're cooking on the menu. Um, however, we don't, look, we don't take cues from our guests about what we're serving as much as we take cues from the farmers. And it's, um, it's really important for us to stay in contact um, because what, as a chef, I'm looking for and the produce especially we buy is flavor. Like I don't want a seed that's grown because it's uniform or because um, it's stable. I, I want um, a, a plant that's grown for flavor. So I'm interested in the taste. Um, I could care less whether the carrot is a baby carrot or a, a medium-sized carrot. Um, as a chef, it's my job to figure out how to cook both of those deliciously. 
Um, but I think that um, it, it's transparency in, in how the farmers grow the food. Um, it's having the conversations with them. We have a, a few farms that every year come to us and say, um, okay, next season, is there something that um, we don't have that you want us to plant for you? Or is there, um, is there a variety that we're not, we're not having? And um, I think those conversations are really important. Um, and I trust the farms that we're working, working with. Um, so I think the science part is a little hard, harder for me to understand because I'm, I'm not in it at researching every day. Um, but I think I need to be comfortable with um, the farmers' decisions on these on these topics um, because without um, a transparent system, um, I can't feel good about the food that I'm serving you all when you come to the restaurant. Excellent. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of continuing this, Sam, you, as we acknowledged, have worn multiple hats um, that are relevant for this space. Um, you're thinking as you know, as you moved into the private sector. Um, what do you, how do you feel about what's coming along? How do you feel about regulation or the lack thereof? How do you feel about uh, CRISPR moving through the marketplace or transgenic or traditional plant breeding? Uh, Open-ended, big question. Yeah, uh, I'll try to not. I'll try to be succinct. I think that just it's important though to clarify. Um, one thing, I think the easiest way to understand the difference between GMO and gene editing is GMO is based on foreign DNA entering the genome and gene editing is the manipulation of the genetic material that currently resides in the plant. It's a really fundamental divide. Um, I think the other big thing uh, which gives us great potential or possibility of this technology and great risk uh, is that it can be done much faster, uh, much more precise, uh, and much cheaper than GMOs, um, which gives us a chance potentially to solve some of the biggest problems I think we're facing, but could also lead us down some really dark paths that we have to be quite careful about. And it's, we're just at the beginning, and so it's unclear which path we're going to take. Uh, right now, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the most common understanding of the reason why like junk food is more uh, is cheaper than, than healthy food, and this whole narrative around like government subsidies is total nonsense. The reason that our food system is skewed to the way that it is, to the extent that it is, that a double cheeseburger is cheaper than carrots, is because we figured out how to grow corn and soy super efficiently. We've invested hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars for decades to figure, and it, it, to the point where it's kind of a miracle how many bushels of corn and soy we can get out of an acre. That's why our junk food is cheap. We've invested statistically insignificant amount of money in figuring out how to grow fruits and vegetables in a more efficient manner. Um, and it has skewed the cost of our entire food system. What I see the potential is for gene editing is the possibility to actually figure out how to grow more nutrient dense crops that taste better, that need way less chemicals to grow at scale, um, potentially less water, all the various things and challenges that we face um, in a way that we just have not had the possibility because GMO was so expensive, it never made sense to do it to broccoli. It's just like all those big guys have all looked at it. They all have actually a big plant traditional breeding seed companies, but it just never made sense because the economic model never worked. The question we should be asking ourselves is, what are the values that we want to shape the use of this technology for? Who is this technology going to serve? Because when you go into, the big problem with GMOs is that in the end, they didn't help eaters. They certainly didn't help uh, lots of farmers. They helped a certain subset of farmers and some big corporations, but they didn't help a lot of farmers. They definitely didn't help the land because it made the system that basically uh, mortgaged our soil and water resources, uh, which are now depleted. Um, so we have to, add, I think that's the, those are the core questions we should be asking ourselves, um, is to whom this technology benefits. I think on the just a, a quick point on the regulation, and then, uh, then I'll stop for, for now, uh, is um, th th that part right now is uh, very scary. Because it, so far, USDA has considered any, any edited plant to be grass, generally regarded as safe, which means there's no oversight. Um, now, the EPA still has to rule on it. The FDA still has to rule on it. Um, and so we'll see, it's a sort of broad swath of technology. Right now, when you're just like making an apple not brown, like no big deal, like uh, th that's safe. Uh, but 
the potential, right, right now most of the technology can knock out genes, basically silence the genes, but what's gonna come is the ability to both silence genes and express genes, materials that's in there that's not being expressed. Any basic biologist can tell you, you can create all kinds of allergens or toxins or problems in the genetic material of a plant. Um, and with no oversight, not only do I think some big problems could happen for the food system, but also I, th I think we need this tool in our toolbox. I'm not sure how it's gonna be used, but I think considering what's happening in the climate, considering where the food system's going, the, the, how hard it's going to be to grow food, considering all the problems we have now with obesity and hunger and all these things now, it's gonna get 10 times worse really fast. So I think we need this option, and if something goes wrong, consumer backlash could lead to overregulation and basically elimination of this sort of set of tools, which I also find concerning. So I see huge promise and a ton of risk um, in, in where we're headed. I want to, one of the things you said that I think is really important here, and I think um, with a lot of the rhetoric, especially around GMO and genetic engineering technology comes back, is that question of the problem that we're trying to solve and the ones that we are identifying, and in doing that, what we're developing. Um, based on where you're, where you're sitting right now, looking more at how this is develop, developing in the marketplace, like how, what is CRISPR being used to make right now? And is it actually a problem we have when we look at climate change, when we look at public health, et cetera? Um, so a lot of it's um, being held pretty close to the vest right now. From the things that I'm seeing, I think you're seeing Exploration. Is it the same big companies who were, you know, like head on with GM or is it new companies that are emerging? Everybody's looking at it. Okay. Uh, I mean, everybody, meaning, of course, all the big guys are exploring what they can do with that. Um, and all the current GMO patents are all coming off patents. So that material now is available for everybody in a way that's actually mixing up the whole marketplace for the biggest crops. I mean, most of what we grow is corn, soy, and then wheat, right, in the United States. And you put rice and you kind of got most of the world right there. Um, so, of course, the big guys are looking at it, but what's interesting is that there's all these startups who now have a much lower barrier to entry who can actually start developing businesses around a different set of values, and that's happening, and that's a big threat. So, I do think you're going to see some big innovations on corn and soy, uh, uh, which hopefully will bring some value back to those farmers, because you gotta, the other thing you got to remember is, like, even those farmers, they're getting screwed, too. Uh, they, over time, if you look, the, the amount of money that the farmer retains has just gone down for the last hundred years. Like as well as the just number of farmers. Number of farmers have gone down and their share of the dollar, the food dollar, has just gotten smaller and smaller. So this could be the first time in a long time where maybe some farmers can get some of that share back because the cost of these technologies can come way down um, because you can innovate much cheaper than you otherwise used to. So they, the few big guys have such a lock on the market, the price is super high and they're just getting screwed. Um, like those, these farmers, they hate those guys. Like they're using their products, but they, they've gotten, they've gotten a raw deal. So, um, you know, so I think, um, I think that's part of the, the part of the promise, um, of, you know, of, of how the farmer could ultimately benefit. But you're seeing startups that are looking at all these different crops. And I find that to be, you know, both, I think, exhilarating and a bit terrifying. I mean, that's sort of how I'm looking at it. Yeah. No, Urvashi, when we were talking yesterday, um, this came up too, this question of uh, real problems and whose problems and who we're serving. Um, you've looked at, when you were at Consumer Reports for years, you were looking at this as really GM technology was, you know, earlier on at least. Um, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about this too. Um, thanks. And, um, you know, as a scientist, I think technology is pretty cool. And I think there's a lot of great applications for it. And I also think, though, in studying the food system for so long that there, there are so many problems with it. And it's going to require a lot more than um, any single approach. Um, and I don't think it starts with the plant, actually. It starts with the soil. Um, and just like just the panel right before this was talking about gut biomes, and it turns out there's an entire biome in the soil, does something very similar that our gut biomes do too. It's actually responsible for nutrient uptake. It's responsible for a healthy gut. 
Um, and it actually plays a role in nutrient uptake in plants. And so anyone who has seen Symphony of the Soil by Deborah Garcia, if you haven't, please do. It's an amazing film. And there's an ocean of activity in the soil. When you apply synthetic fertilizers with very high nitrogen rates or phosphate rates or you uh, use a lot of herbicides or pesticides, you essentially kill the biome in the soil. Uh, it just can't survive that kind of um, surge in different nutrients and the nutrient overload is actually what disrupts the entire balance. So when you think of things like fertilizer runoff in the Chesapeake Bay and the kill off in the Bay, it's all due to this excessive nutrient. It's too much nutrient basically, which is actually a bad thing. And our agricultural system is predicated on that. Uh, I don't see some of these newer technologies addressing any of those things. In fact, in some ways it's made it worse. Um, corn and soy GMO products have actually increased glyphosate use in the environment. Glyphosate was originally thought to be one of those pesticides that was a little bit less toxic than some of the other ones that are out there. It turns out we're dumping tons of it and it's getting into the food supply. Um, GMOs haven't helped that. They've made that problem worse, actually. Um, in terms of you know, as a scientist, we have studied genetic issues in the environment mostly as mutations, like in, in getting cancer or causing problems and disrupting the genome. And it's kind of the impetus why we wanted to study the genome to begin with, so we could start to get a handle of where these disruptions were taking place and how we could get little Band-Aids in to maybe prevent a child from developing full-blown leukemia or maybe dealing with something that we can actually treat, you know, as a cancer. Today, we still can't deal with a lot of it. Um, and we've taken what we've learned and turned it into this somehow ability to control everything and that we're in control of it all. And even though things like CRISPR get us down to levels where it's one gene, it doesn't just modify one thing. And so biochemists know this. They know that in manipulating just one gene, they're still not in control of what comes out the other end. So when you take that kind of technology and you now put it into pollen and let it procreate with the rest of the environment, you've lost control of it. Um, if you're making the impossible burger, burger bleed, you're creating 47 other soy hemoglobins that are going into the burger in addition to the one they wanted to create. Now, and I'm not sure though, just for clarification, I'm not sure if like Impossible has been developed using CRISPR or what kind of technology was used for it, but yeah, I just want to be... It's a modified engineered yeast to produce the heme that comes from a soy. And I don't know whether it's CRISPR or not. I guess I'll just say that the outcomes of either are very similar. And there is a really interesting article that the engineer who worked for Monsanto who developed the non-browning potato put out. And it's in his own words. And so right now it's on cornucopia.org and I really encourage you all to read it because it's an engineer's tale of his own regrets in doing this because from a scientific point of view and standing this close, it seemed like it was a really great idea. And there are really great applications for this like being able to test contamination around industrial farms that is on people's houses and causing huge public health problems. We need the technology for that. We need it in the hands of people who can do that. I, know, I don't know about the application in this way and the inadvertent things it causes. The guy who did the potato says that it actually turned off other genes he didn't mean to turn off. And it actually caused two toxins to arise in potatoes that weren't there in the first place. So I don't think it's so easy. I don't think it's so clean. As a scientist, I'm not bold enough to think that we are in control of that. We're not. And we're just in a phase of studying it, and I think we should use it to our advantage where we can. And we know what sustainable ag is. It's about production from soil to the end of the farm line and being good stewards about that every step of the way. So I'll be quiet for now, but that's my perspective on it. Yeah, I, I do have, <laughs> I, yeah, that's great. Um, before I move into just a final conversation point, and then to questions. Um, did anybody want to respond to what Urvashi said? Sam, I saw you furring, fur, furrowing your brow, but um, maybe that was just pensive. Oh, don't, yeah, I have no problem with disagreement. 
I'm not sure I disagree with anything you say. I also don't know. I, I was trying to understand exactly what you were saying uh, in the sense that, yes, there's uh, problems can come from breeding. That's true for any approach of plant breeding. Uh, things you can get outcomes that you didn't expect. Uh, I don't think the idea is that you, you know, um, uh, that it's the farming is about control. And so, and of control and manipulation of the environment, manipulation of genetics, that's what it's always been about. We transformed our environment to be an agriculture society. So I think the question is like, I think the, so I, I, I think in your, the, I think what I hear you say in your values, I totally agree with. Um, but it like, we have to just be very careful to demonize a tool. Um, it's really about the application of that tool. And, and so I was just, I think I was just trying to figure out your opinion on, on that. Cause, yeah. cause, cause, the GMOs is like, I kind of think we're, we're moving past GMOs. GMOs are like an old bludgeon tool that feels to be pretty dated. And I think technology is about to surpass that. Those guys are going to get really disrupted. And so the question is like, what, what do you think about what comes next? Um, like, because I actually think part of the, what's exciting to me is like, you could think about uh, plants now that actually can be sequestering nitrogen, that, that that basic trait can be turned on in lots of different plants. It could be about actually much less of those chemical applications to the soil so that we can start regenerating soil. What you say about soil is 100% true. Most of our soil is dead. Most, most of it's gone and what it exists is dead. So like I agree in terms of that you know, focus in terms of what's possible. Maybe you're saying that you don't think any of that's going to happen. I don't think that gets addressed in the technology. I think that problem still exists and in some cases is exacerbated by the technology. I also think that the proteins you want to make, you are in somewhat control of, but in the, in the example, for example, of the Impossible Burger, it's 47 in proteins that are new to the market. No one's ever eaten them before. They don't exist in nature. And so those are the types of things where one is part of the reason we need regulation, Two, FDA actually told them that it was a real problem and they were concerned about it. Now, they don't have to do anything because anybody can introduce new food ingredients to the market without a whole lot of testing. It's just the way it is um, under grass. But unfortunately, it also allows a company to really dismiss what FDA is saying at this time. It's surprising FDA even registered a concern. They often don't. They mostly yeah, no, I'm, don't. I'm in violent agreement with you on that. I mean, it's like... The, the way the oversight system works, having been in it, it's insane. You, you, like, nobody's looking at that stuff. Nobody is. Yeah, it's a huge problem. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Brock <laughs> yes, says, don't please. boo, vote. Yes. Okay. Just to add a point here. So it's interesting hearing this conversation. I think something else to consider is, so let's put this scenario out there. Let's say GMO does disappear. As I agree, that technology is old and in a lot of ways is disappearing. Let's say CRISPR doesn't even prove to be as successful as they want. Let's say we use classical breeding and we create corn that's as resistant and amazing as they are trying to do with GMO. There's still a really important problem that we haven't addressed. The amount of corn that we're growing. The fact that this solution, however we get to it and however we debate it, we're still growing millions of acres of corn and then we're consuming millions of acres of corn indirectly because it's a commodity. So remember, where is our intention in this process? Our intention is to figure out how to grow commodities better and we're gonna argue about the technology, which is justified, but also we have to remember that there's something I think about all the time. Every time I drive upstate, like really upstate, like I, I work in Westchester, that's not upstate for all you from New York. <laughs> My, I used to grow, I grew up in the city and my friends think I live hours away. I'm like, it's easier for me in Westchester to get to you than for you to get to the West Village. But it doesn't resonate. But anyway, so either way, I'm not upstate. I'm saying you're driving upstate and all you see are fields of corn and soy. It's not just happening in the Midwest. And everyone, I hear constant conversation like, we're not growing enough food by 2050. How are we going to feel these people? I'm like, what if we try to grow food? We're not... We're not even growing food. That's an important thing. So, so just, to tie, just to tie it all up, I'm like, you can grow. And what we do with our principles of agroecology at Stoneburns, we're trying to teach people how to grow food in efficient ways on small scales and not necessarily jump to that commodity scale. Because it's just an, another point that I think is important for us to bring in. And then also Let's gets back food. to like, what is the problem we're solving? What are the types of um, problems we're identifying and how is that incentivized? 
I, I was reading just um, last night, just in getting ready for this panel, that the Cavendish banana, as we all know, is in great peril because we've been monoculturing this one banana, not unlike the turkey you might get for Thanksgiving, but it's one breed. And as a result, it's super vulnerable to disease, to climate change, to everything else. And we're trying to address that now by putting a gene into the Cavendish banana. The reason we ended up in this whole situation is because we went down to one species and we didn't use biodiverse culture, uh, culturing. And, and, and I know we didn't talk so much about that, but I know Stone Barns has been really behind um, biodiversity. And that is integral, actually, to the future of agriculture. And Olivier de Schutter, who is one of the co-authors of the IPCC report that was recently released, has an amazing presentation about this and um, the fact that we need more biodiversity. We need animals and vegetables on the farms together. This notion of distilling and winnowing and putting into corners is actually the opposite of what we need to do in order to increase fertility, bring that fertility back into the soils where it is totally dead, um, and being able to use our agricultural senses and our tools in a way that cultivates and fosters yeah. that. Just a, just a quick build. I mean, I couldn't agree with what you said anymore, like in the most intense way. And I think that in the context of this technology conversation about this one very specific technology, it is not the devil and it's not the savior, right? This is a tool and the question is how we're gonna use it. But the problems in our system are so much more deeply rooted in our culture and who we are, what we value uh, and where we're driving towards and what we're actually consuming, right? So I think it's important to couch, this ends up, this, this topic ends up taking on a way outsized role in terms of what's actually driving and shaping uh, what we're doing and where we need to go. And so actually I just, part of, I think, as we get more transparency, more discussions, like we can need to put it in its proper place and make sure we're continuing to talk about the bigger questions, which is we're growing a bunch of, most of what we grow, we're not eating. And that's a, that is a fundamentally inefficient way to nourish ourselves. And it's having a devastating impact on the climate. It's driving climate change and will be the number one driver of climate change within the next probably 20 years. So like, that's the bigger conversation that this needs to sit in and have a sort of a proper balance in how we weight uh, these sort of issues. I would love to continue having this conversation for like two more hours. Um, but I do want to have uh, a chance for the audience to ask some questions. And I'll start with this woman right here and wander around. I love that somebody shouted out vote. And I would love to feel like I knew who to vote for. But I don't know if other people in this room feel this way. I feel like agriculture is so rarely a part of the national political conversation. I wouldn't even know who to vote for, who I felt like cared or had similar views to the people in this room about these issues. So how do we like either make politicians care or who are the politicians who care? Because I feel like it's the biggest issue and no one ever talks about it on the national stage. Okay, so people vote on it people engage on it, they just aren't doing it here. When you go to Iowa, it's the number one issue. You go to, you go to uh, Ohio, big issue. Pennsylvania, big You go to a lot of these farm, Nebraska, in Texas, these guys are voting on these issues. And their farmers and corporate companies are showing up. The problem is here, we aren't talking to our representatives about it. We aren't saying, what's your food policy? What are you doing to make sure that the food that's showing up in our grocery stores is grown in a much healthier, more sustainable way that I can afford and our communities can afford? We're not doing that. That's on us. Uh, when, when politicians don't like it when you show up. They hate it. They, it, it matters. They pay attention who's calling. They pay attention who's coming to visit them. Um, and without that support, even if you get somebody inside who's trying to make a change, they can't get very far. We, Part of our big barrier was, I would have to honestly uh, pretend at times, this is being recorded, I, I, I'm, I'm, in trouble. I'm in trouble now, but to be like, we're going to get crushed if we do this policy. All the good food people are going to kick our butts. And then sometimes I'd win some, and sometimes I'd lose some, but I'd go back to my phone, ready to get my butt kicked, and I wouldn't get a single phone call. I'd call up you today, be like, you heard from anybody? And in the issues that everybody's screaming about, GMOs, Dicamba, 2,4-D, all this stuff that everybody's all upset about, not a single phone call, not one. 
So it, that's on us. Politicians are only going to go until, until we start saying we're going to vote on these issues, and we are not voting on these issues. So you got to show up. You got to get involved. You got to roll up your sleeves, and it's got to start as local as you possibly can. School board, city council, mayor, and work your way up. But showing up has a way bigger impact. They like to pretend like it doesn't. They hate it. They will say anything to get you out of their office. I promise you, having having done it. <laughs> uh, so um, we got to we got to start organizing and start getting more engaged. It's really going to be driven by by people, and that's how it works. I'll add to that just one quick thing. Uh, James Beard has been doing really great work with that. Um, they've been doing chefs boot camps all over the country. Um, I went to one a year ago in Vermont, and um, they're telling us that as chefs we have a voice, so I guess I do. Um, but uh, they're, they're trying to teach chefs how to um, understand what's going on in our food system, um, not just in New York City, but um, across the country, and um, teaching us how to go to DC and, and lobby for, um, for changes. So um, it, you, I'm sure you can look it up on the website, but it's, it's been a pretty big program that's been over the past uh, few years that's uh, really great and hopefully will drive some change. And a point I want to make about Suzanne's presence on this panel in a city like New York City is like chefs are tastemakers and particularly in our moment when food is really a way that um, we're expressing ourselves and we're getting interested in it in, in more in different ways. But what Suzanne puts on the plate, even though it might be at a certain price point, even though it might be for, you know, a small dining room, it matters. Um, it matters because of social media and it matters because of what it makes us crave. So uh, we're, what James Beard is doing, uh, I think, is very important and including chefs in this conversation about um, uh, that responsibility is important. Anyway, Jason, Rashi. I just wanted to add another great resource is the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, NSAC. They're a, small, a semi-small group, but they are actively getting in the ear of politicians. Also, you know, you email them, you call them, you check out their website. They will give you the list of people that are fighting for, you know, causes that relate to this idea of sustainable, regenerative agriculture. So it's a good place to get some resources because the names, there's only so many names on the ballot and some of them will line up there. So it's a good, it's a good resource. Yeah, a couple other plugs, Food and Water Watch, uh, Environmental Working Group, Natural Resources Defense Council, National Organic Coalition, all working on ag issues, all almost have it down to the representatives themselves. They do a lot of Hill meetings. Um, so they, they've got it at least mapped out. So if you've got questions about your own local uh, representatives, check out one of these sites because they can be really helpful. I think I see a question back there. Sorry. Hey, how's it going? Uh, this is kind of a question playing off with uh, both uh, Yervashi and Jason said, talking about you know the issue of monocultures and also nutrients in the food we're actually eating. Um, a lot of people are talking about the factors you know current conventional farming kind of sees soil as a substrate, not an ecosystem, and it's important to recognize nutrient well ecosystem to import nutrient uptake in the plants. Um, no one's really talking about the increase in CO2 in the environment, in the air. Um, one big thing that's kind of discerning is that. Most of the plants we eat, they come, from the, they come from POCA, grasses. And they have a type of carbon fixation called C3. It's how they extract CO2 out of the air and use it to make starches. Um, so this kind of playing out all the research from uh, Araka Loza from uh, the Bryan uh, Life Science Institute from Arizona University. Uh, a lot of the preliminary research he's done shows that with the increase in CO2 in the environment and the atmosphere, um, plants in the C3 carbon fixation, uh, fixation family are, getting, are absorbing less minerals out of the soil. They're making starches. So in general, how do we solve it? Because in general, one of the plants that has C4 fixation that isn't affected by this is actually corn. Anybody want to respond? Um, I, just quickly, I think those are really, you know, you are talking about where the edge of science is and looking at this. I mean, I think that there is an amazing amount of promise in pasture and in not managing manure. Um, lagoon pits of manure are complete uh, climate change gas hazards, and there are a number of other things. So I hear you. I think, though, when you look at, for example, grass-fed beef that's grown on incredibly diverse pasture, there is a higher carbon sequestration rate compared to just grass that's not uh, maintained in a regenerative state or with good soil. And what's really I, 
I see what you're saying, but within the study of a given one, they're making comparisons between baseline and what they can actually do now. So the potential for carbon sequestration is higher. What are all the variables to optimize that? Those are things we have to sort out over time. There's no question, though, that in addition to climate impacts, really good biodiverse pasture makes for healthier cows. They digest better. They make better conjugated linoleic acids. They have better omega-3 to 6 ratios. And that nutrient density actually translates to the meat and the dairy itself. And that's amazing. That's from the soil all the way through. So I hear you, and we should magnify on these various challenges that are scientific challenges. All the answers aren't there. But we know the directions that we need to go in, and certainly biodiversity carbon sequestration and soil health are a triangulation that need optimization, but that have a very close connection to one another. Okay. A question over here, just so I don't ignore the side of the room. Okay, yep. Hi, thanks, I'll try to keep it brief, but I think we're talking a lot, it's really interesting that we're talking a lot about, um, so beyond the plant, what are these other issues regarding soil? I'm curious what you guys think about soilless farming as a response to, because GMOs and gene editing have come into play as a way to make plants more resistant to the environment. Well, what happens when we forget about that and just try to control the environment and not the plant? Yeah, I, I would love to. Um, I love that this question came up in this conversation because it's very similar. So let's, I mean, one example, aquaponics, another example, hydroponics, right? These systems that are very reduced down. Now, these are incredible opportunities. The same way, understanding genetics, understanding how did we even get to transgenics? How did we get to understand CRISPR? How did we get CRISPR to be cheap enough? To me, they all fall in the same category. This is an incredible way for us to understand plants in a deeper level. And we know that the more we understand about the genome, the more we have a deeper relationship with that plant. I mean, it is insane what we've done to corn, but we haven't done nearly as much with squash. We don't know the genome as well as we know the corn genome. So now, how does that apply to what you're saying? Well, these are incredible opportunities for us to look at plants in a very controlled environment and learn about plants. But the thing that concerns me is the jump from, we're gonna learn a lot about plants to 200 million dollars being invested in a system that hasn't proven it's profitable or that it can feed people in a way that's nutritious enough for them to survive. So I would say it's the same thing. We don't want to get so scared that we shut down these technologies because we didn't know enough, but we don't want to get so excited that we forget about the soil and we forget about the health that comes from that and the natural resilience we can develop by breeding and growing in the natural environment, which is going to change. Because do we because even though those are great, I mean, I don't think we necessarily, the exciting future isn't covering the planet in warehouses. I don't think that's the jump we need to make just yet. Because there's this amazing thing going on where working with the soil, increasing carbon sequestration, cover cropping, including diversity, coming back to the farm as consumers and as farmers, that can actually improve our environment and the way we live. So I think it's important to keep them in perspective. That would be my shorter version of that. Love that um, just quickly, my concern with soilless systems and why it was such a great controversy in organic, a um, lot of people not wanting hydroponic systems is because it's completely input driven. So it doesn't rely on nature. It doesn't cultivate regenerative practices in the environment. It's, it's something where you must, it's like taking vitamins instead of food all day and then you, you get the output. It's not as well absorbed. It's not as well taken in. I don't know who's had a hydroponic tomato compared to one in season from the ground, they're very different. And, um, you know, taste is hard to quantitate as a science, but that said, um, I actually think soil is the terroir, and that's why so many of us are here, is because we love food and what it tastes, and, and I just think soilless systems start to move us away. That isn't to say I don't think urban aquaponics is an interesting endeavor or hydroponics don't serve some purpose in certain places, um, but again, as a replacement or something that is a valid alternative to soil-based systems, uh, I I'm not somebody that sees it as part of that holistic uh, solution. So I'm just gonna keep playing the role of like the unpopular perspective. <laughs> I know my role today. Uh, and like, I don't, 
what you said was beautiful and like so spot on, man. You're awesome. Uh, but, and, and I agree with everything. I just agree with everything that was just said. But I, 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 we're, we're sort of saying that within a bit of utopia and a bit of idealism that I don't think is actually playing out in, our, in the real world. So I think these are good goals to be driving towards. But like things are really messed up, everybody. Like our environment is like in a really bad place. It's way worse than we think. It's happening way faster than we realize. And like it's going to be about like real survival. I don't want to be an alarmist here, but when you start looking at these numbers, you look where the water tables are. You look what's happening with soil. You look at population movements. You look what's happening with food prices already just now. And we haven't even started yet. That I just think we need to not be um, too pure about how we understand what tools we have. Because I think it's going to take literally everything we got to even come close to maintaining the completely unacceptable level of quality of life for so many people right now. And we say that all, if you're in this room, you're doing really well. But there's a lot of people already right now who are really not being served properly, and it's about to get so much worse. And so I just think we gotta make sure we're not taking things off the table because they don't reach some ideal for us that like our tomato isn't the perfect tasting tomato. I want to, I love, I grow tomatoes in perfectly organic soil that I make my own compost. Like I'm living the life. Like I believe in it wholeheartedly. I did it at the White House. It's like my whole life. But I also care about making sure that everybody gets a tomato, even if it's not the perfect tomato. And that may take indoor growing. I don't know. But I just want to make sure that we don't start passing too many harsh judgments too soon before we and take, start taking some tools off our, out of our toolbox. So I just, I, quick response, I, do, I, I actually agree with much of what you're saying, and I don't think we should be too utopian. I think GMO technology in the state it's in and not having full control and sort of putting it into the market is a utopian point of view that I don't think we should be actually deceiving ourselves that it is a panacea and that we know everything we're doing or that we're not maybe causing other problems. Um, so I, we have a lot of problems, but we actually know how to address them. And I guess I just want to say this feeding the world notion, we waste 40% of our food off the farm, 40% out the grocery store. If we could just take care of that, we could actually feed 9 billion people today. Um, we already can do it. It's not a pro it, That problem is a bit of an invented problem by people who want to push um, an industry that has a lot of money behind it um, that isn't completely thought through or regulated. And so we have to take a pause and be realistic, not utopian, but very realistic about what we're doing and not keep causing inadvertent harm, which is what we've been doing up until now with all the chemicals, fertilizers, et cetera, in modern day agriculture. Right, we're gonna have to conclude there, but thank you everyone. <laughs>